Welcome to Whimsical Pictures, the history of manga. Um, this is a recording of a talk that I originally gave at Anime Central 2016 in Chicago, Illinois. Um, the goal of this panel is to give a very brief, because of time restrictions, overview of the history of comics in Japan. Um, so you're probably wondering who on earth I am and why I'm giving a talk about the history of comics in Japan. Um, I have a degree in history from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and my primary focus is the history of 20th century popular culture. Um, I'm very interested in the historical context of the art that we continue to interact with today, um, as well as how historical events are depicted um, within art. Um, for example, I wrote my thesis on changing depictions of criminals and the FBI in 1930s gangster movies. Um, any semester that you get to watch James Cagney movies for an entire semester is a great semester, in my opinion. Um, but probably, to be honest, the biggest thing that qualifies me to talk about manga is I love comics. Um, comics of all types, newspaper comics, comics that get released monthly in single issues, uh, comics that get released in trades, um, and the very first graphic novel that I ever owned was this one. Um, manga was my entry point into reading comics, um, and even as I've gotten older and branched out into different genres and styles, um, I'm still reading manga, and I probably always will. So if you're looking for me to give you a precise date as far as when what we know as comics started, um, or when comics began in Japan, um, you're probably going to be disappointed because no one can agree on a precise definition of comics. Um, if you grabbed a random person off the street and said, what's a comic, they'd probably say something along the lines of, um, it's a series of pictures with dialogue and word balloons that tries to tell some kind of story. Which sounds great, except it's not precisely true. Um, comics don't have to have words in them in order to convey some kind of story or joke. And a lot of comics, such as political cartoons or gag comics, um, are only one panel long. Um, and they don't really tell a full story. Um, it's mostly just one joke or one um, thought-provoking image. Also, a lot of the most famous comics artists in our culture are not generally thought of as comics artists. Um, they're generally considered as artists who worked in a different format, um, even though what they are doing is using images and text to tell a sequential story. So really, if we're looking for a series of images, sometimes with text, that tell some kind of story or evoke some kind of emotion, Humans have been making comics literally since the beginning of language. Um, this is the Bio Tapestry. It is a British tapestry that depicts the Norman conquest of England. Um, it is a series of images with text. Um, the text just below the top border um, is in fact a description of the images below it. Um, the bio tapestry is only about a foot and a half tall, but it is almost 230 feet long. Um, and it's actually incomplete. We don't know how long it was in its original format. Um, so it's kind of like taking a newspaper comic strip and stretching it out really, really long. So if we can't really answer the question of when comics began, then we have to shift the focus of this presentation to what makes manga manga? What makes Japanese comics unique and distinguishable? Um, for example, these two images that you're looking at right now, 
um, have no identifying characteristics. I didn't label them with a title, a date, an artist, or an author. But you can pretty clearly tell that the one on the left is an American comic and the one on the right is a Japanese comic. Um, the one on the left is a Fantastic Four comic from the late 60s slash early 70s, um, and the one on the right is Cyborg 009 um, from the 70s. So how is it that we can look at these two pictures and immediately tell just from the artwork that one is American and one is Japanese? Where did this particular style of Japanese comics come from? So Scott McCloud, who is a fan of comics, a creator of comics, and an all-around scholar of comics, identifies eight uh, major characteristics of mainstream manga storytelling. Um, obviously, we're going to get into the fact that there's a wide variety of art styles and narrative techniques within manga. Um, Scott McCloud is focusing on highly influential manga that has a broad audience, both in Japan and overseas. Um, so the first of those is iconic characters and a broad variety of character designs. Um, and what he means is that the characters are all clearly distinct from each other in their physical appearance as well as their position in the narrative. Um, so in this One Piece example, you know, we have the beautiful woman, um, we have, you know, the tomboyish female sidekick, we have the cute animal sidekick, um, the tough guy, the suave guy. Um, each of these characters is easily distinguishable um, through their character design and also through the way they move through the narrative. Manga also has a strong sense of place, and it frequently uses wordless panels. Um, I put the two of these together because wordless panels are frequently used to establish that strong sense of place. Um, the example up here is Miyazaki's artwork from Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Um, Miyazaki, as we'll get to a little bit later, is heavily influenced by French comics, um, so he has a strong focus on using environment, um, the physical environment that his characters are moving through, to set the tone of the story. Um, we've also got small real world details. Um, this is a page from Nana. It depicts the strawberry glasses that are a metaphorical representation of the two main characters' friendship. Um, if you've ever read Nana, you know that the cigarettes that the characters smoke are also an important detail throughout the narrative. Um, a lot of manga also depicts eating scenes, um, characters sitting down to have a meal together. Um, and this is an example of the kind of small real world details that manga likes to pull out and use in their artwork. Perhaps the most defining characteristic of manga that Scott McCloud identifies is something that he calls subjective motion. Um, a lot of American comics, especially prior to the 70s, um, have this sense that you're watching the characters up on a stage or you're watching them through the box of a television. Um, you are an onlooker. You're not really part of the action. It's unfolding in front of you, um, but you don't get to see it from within. Subjective motion places you within the action, um, next to or behind or very close to the characters. Um, as in this example from Naruto, where we almost seem to be charging towards Zabuza along with Kakashi. Um, you also see the strong use of motion lines, um, which is a defining characteristic of action manga. Then there's emotionally expressive effects. Um, this is probably the most obvious characteristic to people who are new to manga. Um, you know, you've got the extreme exaggeration of the bulging veins, the sweat drops, the huge empty eyes, the dramatic dropping jaws, um, the nosebleeds that indicate sexual arousal, um, all of the extremely cartoony um, shorthand that artists use to express strong emotion. 
And then we've got genre maturity. Um, unlike American comics, manga has always managed to hold on to a wide variety of genres. Um, for example, we've got The Drifting Classroom, which is a horror manga, Slam Dunk, which is a sports manga, Doraemon, which is a children's manga, Vampire Knight, which is a paranormal romance, and Planetess, which is science fiction. So how did comics get their start in Japan? Um, obviously, we can't identify the very beginning of comics, but we can talk about some early influencers and some early examples of Japanese art that we'll later see echoed in present-day comics. Um, back in the 1100s, the Bishop Toba uh, drew a series of scrolls um, that starred either Buddhist priests or anthropomorphic animals who were often posing as Buddhist priests. Um, there was no real panel division in his artwork, but as you unroll the scrolls, you could see the same characters moving through a series of actions or situations. Um, I really enjoy these scrolls because they have a lot of storytelling techniques that are common to comics and animation. Um, back in the golden age of Warner Brothers um, and Fleischer cartoons. You know, you've got the cute animals in these slapsticky situations, um, often passing as human or living in a very human-like environment. Um, <clears throat> Toba's cartoons um, seem kind of lightweight, they seem kind of silly, um, to our Western ideas of religion and spirituality. They're a little, it's a little bit odd to see this kind of irreverent artwork coming from a religious figure. Um, but Buddhism has a strong sense of impermanence. The idea that the human body and the world around us is fleeting and that we are ultimately struggling to grasp something greater. So in Buddhist traditions, it's very appropriate to laugh at kind of the silliness um, and the impermanence of the material world. Toba's artwork was so popular that in the 18th century, when woodblock printing became viable, um, a series of picture books with accompanying text was actually named after him. They were called the Toba A. Um, Another common form of woodblock printing was called ukiyo-e. These were prints, um, either single images or little bound books that were available to the common man to purchase. Um, it was almost like the gossip and fashion magazines of the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, it was a way for people in one city to see what was fashionable in another city. Um, it was a way for people who had newfound wealth to decorate their homes. And one of the very popular woodblock artists of the time is actually the man who coins the term manga. And that is Hokusai. Um, his most famous work is The Great Wave off Kanagawa, the poster that has decorated thousands of dorm rooms. Um, Hokusai produced thousands of images throughout his career. Um, the most important for our purposes are a series of drawings that he had bound into a book um, that he referred to as his manga. Um, he was using the word in the sense of whimsical pictures, um, irresponsible pictures, um, basically pictures of no real importance um, because they were not necessarily finished and beautiful works of art in and of themselves, but they were a way for him to study the motion of the human body. Um, and you can see that they kind of tell a story as they go along. Um, there's, a, there's characters moving through a series of pictures, um, doing a particular action, um, but they don't really have a plot structure at this point. Um, characters are not named, um, they're not really struggling against any kind of adversary. Um, it was a way for Hokusai uh, 
to study movement. Um, and his manga, when it was printed for the general public, was extremely popular. In the 1840s, um, we get Commodore Matthew Perry visiting Japan and opening it to the outside world. Um, prior to that point, Japan had been an isolationist country for a long time. Um, they were still a feudal society, and the state-of-the-art American warship that Commodore Perry arrived in was very shocking to them. Um, they had not quite realized just how far ahead of them the rest of the world had moved in terms of technology. Um, and from that point on, there was a strong struggle for what precisely Japan was going to become. Were they going to hold on to their feudal traditions? Were they going to modernize? Um, were they going to settle at something in between two extremes? Um, they, were, they did open themselves up to foreign trade, at first isolated within particular ports or cities. And it's within these trade cities that we begin to see comics flourish in Japan. Um, in 1861, a gentleman named Charles Wergman arrived from England to work for the Illustrated London News. Um, he was familiar with magazines such as the Punch magazine from Britain that you see on the left. Um, which was a popular source of satire and political cartooning in 19th century England. Um, and in 1862, he actually founded the Japan Punch, which had a target audience of foreigners in Japan. Um, Charles Workman was a trained cartoonist um, who introduced speech bubbles um, to Japanese cartooning. Speech bubbles had been used in Western cartoons for some time prior to this, um, but this was a new innovation to the Japanese people. Um, and he, this is an example of one of Wergman's cartoons. Um, it's Japanese people meeting Europeans. So you can see that all of the Europeans are very hairy and have large noses, um, which is how they must have appeared to the Japanese people. Um, Georges Bigot was another important Westerner who kind of introduced some Western political cartooning styles to Japan. Um, he taught art at an army school. Um, he was a strong satirist of Japanese life and was pretty much always in trouble with the authorities. Um, Bigot was very fond of Japan. Um, he was satirizing it from a place of great love. Um, he actually married a Japanese woman and lived in Japan for the rest of his life. Um, this is his journal that he began. It's called the Toba A, named after Bishop Toba. Um, Bigot was also one of the first cartoonists working in Japan to arrange his panels in a narrative. So by the time we get to 1902, we have Japanese artists who are adopting um, these types of comic strategies into their artwork. Um, Rakuten Kitazawa is an extremely famous and influential comics creator. Um, he was the first Japanese artist to run a serialized comic um, in a magazine or newspaper. Um, this is Tagosako to Mokube no Tokyo Kenbutsu, um, which is basically Tagosako and Mokube's Tokyo sightseeing trip. Um, and it's a story about two country bumpkins who come to Tokyo and are extremely confused by modern and urban ways of living. Um, Kitazawa founded a magazine called Tokyo Puck that continued to be very influential up through the Second World War. So in the early 20th century, much of the cartooning in Japan um, took its cues from European cartooning. Um, it was primarily um, either political and satirical or gag cartooning at this time. Um, the Japanese government didn't entirely know what to make of this type of cartooning, um, as they were still kind of working out the kinks of being a more open, 
um, a more democratic and more capitalist society. Um, they didn't totally know what to do with dissent and satire. Um, so it was very, very easy during this time for satirical comics artists and the editors of their magazines and newspapers to be censored or to be put in jail in some way. Um, gag comics and children's comics tended to be safe genres during this period. Um, so a lot of American comic strips were actually very popular because they were family friendly, they were very lighthearted. Um, up on the screen you can see an example of Blondie in Japanese. Um, Blondie was extremely popular um, of all the American comics to come over. Um, and Japanese artists began writing their own four panel kind of what we think of as newspaper comic strips. Um, the one on the left is Saze-san, which began in 1946. Um, it was drawn by Machiko Hasegawa, um, and they continue to make anime adaptations of Saze-san to this day. Um, it was extremely relatable, extremely popular, and influential. Um, in the early 20th century, we also get the first children's magazines that publish story comics. Um, these are the predecessors to the thick Japanese comics magazines like Shonen Jump that we are familiar with today. Um, the earliest ones were published by Kodansha, who continues to be a huge publisher of manga, both in Japan and the United States. Another one of the early influences um, on comics in Japan was a form of entertainment known as the kamishibai. Um, kamishibai was sort of like the puppet shows that were popular in Western countries. Um, but instead of using puppets within a little portable theater, um, the kamishibai narrator would um, scroll images through a box similar to a television box um, and tell a story as these images were rolling across the screen. Um, a lot of kamishibai performers drew their own artwork and many of them would eventually become manga artists. Um, the Kami Shibai stories also had a profound impact on a lot of young children who would go on to draw manga in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Some of the early characters that we get in this time period are, um, for example, Norikuro. Um, Norikuro was a black dog who joined the Japanese army and somehow became a colonel. Um, and his comic was all about his wacky adventures as a dog, um, leading troops into battle. Um, Norikuro was heavily inspired by Felix the Cat, as you can probably tell. Um, during this time period, um, because of the popularity of American animated films and comic strips, and also because international copyright law was either non-existent or unenforceable, um, there is a lot of artwork of Japanese characters crossing over with American comics characters. Um, as in this example where you can see on the far right Norikuro meeting Mickey Mouse. Um, and this is actually a still from an early animation. Tank Tankuro was another popular character. Um, he was essentially this round metal ball that could transform into different shapes and pull a variety of objects out of his holes um, in order to go into battle or to solve problems. Um, I chose Norikuro and Tank Tankuro as my two primary examples because I really enjoy that you can already see two of the common characters of manga, the, you know, adorable semi-anthropomorphized animal and the robot. Um, already at the beginnings of manga, these two characters have been firmly established as popular. So World War II was a dark time for Japanese comics and Japan in general. Um, the Japanese government was by this time highly militarized. Um, comics artists were generally put to work creating war propaganda, 
or if they refused, um, if they challenged the government in any way, they generally either went to jail or left the country. So the 1940s sees a lot of early comics magazines and comics publishers shutting down or changing the focus of their output. Um, after the war, Japan was extremely poor. Um, it had been essentially carpet bombed by the United States. So they had to rebuild much of their infrastructure from the ground up. Um, they were being occupied by American forces and they had to kind of decide um, what they wanted their society to look like going forward. Um, <clears throat> during this time, a lot of family comics and a lot of science fiction comics were very popular um, because they provided either kind of a heartwarming exploration of family values or escapism. Um, and into this kind of empty, amorphous market comes Osamu Tezuka. Um, he is known as, as the king of comics. Um, he is highly regarded by both Western scholars of Japanese manga and by manga creators themselves. Um, so the question is, what's up with this man? Why was he able to step into this void and have such a huge influence over comics creators going forward? Um, Tezuka's background was that he came from a fairly comfortable family. Um, his parents were huge fans of books and film, um, especially from the United States. Um, so Tezuka grew up surrounded by um, great examples of American animation. He was highly inspired by Walt Disney. Um, <clears throat> and he actually went to medical school and became a licensed doctor. Um, but during the entire time that he was in school, he was already producing highly popular and profitable manga. Because Tezuka was so interested in film and so heavily inspired, by cinematography, his comics have an extremely cinematic feeling to them. Um, rather than taking one panel to depict the main character racing in his sports car down a hill, instead we have a series of panels that zoom in on the character's face as he realizes that he's about to run over this dog in the road. Um, we, also start, we also start to get um, the subject of motion that we talked about earlier. Um, if you can see in the last panel on the far left, um, those buildings aren't actually really leaning within the world of the comic. They appear to be leaning as a way to convey the speed at which the car is traveling. Um, this particular example is from Tezuka's New Treasure Island, which was essentially a mashup of Treasure Island and a bunch of other famous action-adventure stories. Um, it was extraordinarily popular, and this particular book gets cited over and over again by the manga creators of the next few decades as a huge influence on their own artwork. So not only was Tezuka's artwork very new and very stylish in a way that appealed to a lot of people, um, there were two other factors in his favor. Um, the first being that he was incredibly prolific. Um, this image is Tezuka sitting in a room full of just some of the books that he produced during his career. Um, <clears throat> he was constantly working, um, constantly churning out new ideas. And he also worked in a wide variety of genres. Um, Today, and even kind of back then, it was very common for a manga artist to specialize in one particular genre. Um, Tezuka did boys comics. He did girls comics. He did kind of more adult, like, thriller medical drama comics. Um, he did very strange and metaphysical experimental comics. Um, he even did comics about the life of Adolf Hitler um, and the life of the Buddha. Um, so Tezuka was able to keep himself relevant to a wide variety of audiences over the course of his career.
And again, I have some examples here of comics artists who specifically cite Tezuka as one of their huge influences. On the left, we've got Fujio Fujiko, who are a team um, of manga artists. It's these two gentlemen who write under one pen name, um, and they specifically cite New Treasure Island um, and the impact that it had on them. And then um, in the bottom right, we've got Yoshihiro Tatsumi um, talking about his meeting with Tezuka when he was a young manga artist. Um, and being essentially unable to look at Tezuka without thinking of the myriad of characters that had had such an impact on Tatsumi's life. Um, behind Tezuka, you can see Tatsumi's representation of a lot of Tezuka's characters. Um, if you'll notice, they seem very American in certain ways. Um, they're highly caricatured. They remind me a lot of Popeye um, and a lot of... Um, Annie and, and many of the American cartoons that were popular at the time. Um, Tezuka deliberately drew his characters that way with big eyes and a very Disney-fied style. Um, so all of the people who ask, why do characters in manga have such big eyes? Well, it's really Disney's fault by way of Tezuka. Tezuka inspired a great many young people to start doing comics of their own, um, but it was very difficult to break into the comics market, um, especially if you wanted to tell stories that were not exactly children's stories, um, if you wanted to tackle more difficult subjects. Um, there wasn't exactly a market for manga of that type. Um, so many young creators who were having a hard time um, with creative control over their own work or having a difficult time making money off of their work in general, um, decided to, in the late 50s and 60s, start a new manga movement called Gekiga, which means dramatic pictures. Um, this uh, is a panel from Yoshihiro Tatsumi's autobiography, A Drifting Life in which he talks about his experience as an early manga and Gekiga creator um, and his coining of the word Gekiga. In 1964, the magazine Garo was founded by Katsuichi Nagai. Um, Garo was never very popular. Um, its highest circulation was only 80,000 copies. Um, which at the time was an extremely small amount. Um, Katsuichi Nagai often couldn't even afford to pay the artists who put their work in the pages of his magazine, but Garo was still a powerful draw because anyone who submitted artwork to the magazine had full creative control over the types of stories that they told. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> a lot of Gekiga creators were eventually kind of adopted by the mainstream. Um, for example, in the middle, that blue issue of, of Garo has um, Gegege no Kitaro by Shigeru Mizuki, um, <clears throat> which is the story of a little boy who meets a lot of demons and otherworldly creatures from Japanese mythology. Um, this was perhaps not seen as child or family appropriate at the time, but as time went by, Gegege no Kitaro became kind of a staple of children's entertainment in Japan, um, to the point that Mizuki's hometown actually has a street lined with statues of his characters. <clears throat> So over time, as mainstream magazines are looking for more of a punch, looking for something that will draw people in to their magazines, they start employing these Gekiga artists, such as Go Nagai, <clears throat> who was one of the early writers for Weekly Shonen Jump, which debuts four years after Garo in 1968. The Gekiga that they were drawing um, tended to be very surreal. Um, on the left, we have Yoshiharu Suge's screw style, 
um, which is a very bizarre story of a boy who discovers that he has a screw in his body and he wanders the town trying to figure out exactly what that means. Um, a lot of the art is highly symbolic. Um, and then we've also got um, Kamui Den, which is an early example of a samurai story in manga. Um, in early manga, samurai stories were not very popular because they were very violent. Um, and it was difficult to depict such a thing in a general interest magazine. Um, you can also see the Kamui Den is done um, with a brush. Much of the artwork is inked um, with a brush, uh, in sim which is very similar to early Japanese artwork and calligraphy. But at the time, it was not a style that was generally found in manga. So in the 60s and 70s, um, a lot of magazines began to appear. Um, like I mentioned, we have Shonen Jump in 1968. Um, the magazines are starting to fracture off into different audiences and different genres, um, including comics for women and girls. Um, in the beginning, many women's comics were actually written and drawn by male artists. Um, this was their way of breaking into the manga world um, before they could move up to the, um, the big leagues, I suppose, of boys and men's comics. Um, but in the 70s, we start to get more and more female artists um, breaking into these big manga magazines. Um, there was a group of them known as the Magnificent 24s because they were all born in the same year, Showa 24. Um, we have Ryoko Ikeda, who wrote the historical fiction The Rose of Versailles, um, which was extraordinarily popular. Um, we have Moto Hagio, who was an early writer of boys' love comics. Um, most of her comics tended to be set in, like, British boarding school type settings um, where two young boys would fall in this like chaste and deeply romantic love with each other. Um, shoujo manga is especially notable for literally breaking the boundaries of comic design and comic layout in many ways. Um, this example from Swan, which is a ballet manga um, shows a double page spread that has literally no boundaries. Um, it depicts the movement of one character as she twirls across the page. Um, to this day, manga for girls tends to be very expressionistic, um, very focused on portraying an emotional landscape, um, much more so than physical action or physical surroundings. And these are two of the long-running um, shoujo magazines in Japan, Nakayoshi, um, which has run some very popular works like Cardcaptor Sakura and Ribbon. So up until this point, manga has been pretty much entirely confined to Japan. Um, there has been some success in translating manga for a French-speaking audience. Um, but as far as bringing comics over to the United States um, or to other Western countries, there hasn't been a whole lot of success. Um, one of the early attempts to bring manga to America was in 1978 when a group of manga fans and scholars got together to try to translate Barefoot Gen um, into English. Um, Barefoot Gen is the semi-fictionalized story of Keiji Nakazawa's experiences during World War II. Um, he survived the bombing of Hiroshima, um, and Barefoot Gen tells the story of his family and what they went through um, immediately prior to the bombing and then in the years after the bombing. Um, <clears throat> because of its strong anti-war message, this particular group of manga fans and scholars felt that Barefoot Gen was a very important comic to bring over to the United States. Um, unfortunately, their translation didn't gain a whole lot of traction. Um, you can actually read the entirety of Barefoot Gen in English today, um, but it took several more decades for that to cross the pond. So in Japan, 
manga is generally the gateway into a franchise that includes anime, that includes video games, that includes light novels. Um, generally, it starts with the manga artist and the editor at a big magazine. But in Western countries, it tends to work the other way around. And what finally got American audiences interested in reading manga is anime. Um, and the translation and distribution of certain films, um, such as Akira, um, Ghost in the Shell was very popular in the early 90s. Um, a lot of the science fiction kind of cyberpunk stories that sort of transcend a particular culture were very easy to bring over to the United States. So in the 80s you get more and more of these films appearing in translation and that's when translations of manga actually start to take hold as well. And so then in the mid 80s through the 90s and into the early 2000s um, we have kind of a boom in manga, um, particularly in the world of shonen, um, which is preteen and teenage boys manga. Um, Dragon Ball comes out in the 1980s and is extremely popular and influential. Um, many of the creators of the manga on this screen cite um, Akira Toriyama, the creator of Dragon Ball, as one of their primary influences. Um, <clears throat> All of the series that I've pictured here are extremely popular both in Japan and in the United States. Um, <clears throat> so in the early to mid 2000s, we get this huge growing bubble of manga being translated into English, um, fueled in no small part by One Piece, Naruto, Roroni Kenshin, Bleach, etc. By now, the manga bubble has kind of burst. Um, some publishers, such as Tokyo Pop, have gone out of business, although we're still seeing a healthy publication of manga in the United States. Um, manga is here to stay. It has its own bestseller list on the New York Times. Um, <clears throat> and manga has, by now, planted its roots in countries around the world. Um, here we have some examples of manga and anime fan magazines, books, and artwork um, from a variety of countries. Um, some of the biggest adopters and fans of manga live in countries that are physically close to Japan. Um, for example, in Taiwan, uh, many manga publishers will put out new issues of their comics um, within hours or or within perhaps a day or two of their release in Japan. Um, <clears throat> Thailand um, is a huge consumer of manga. China is a huge consumer of manga, although much of it tends to be pirated instead of officially licensed. Um, and South Korea um, produces its own comics that are very heavily manga inspired. Um, there is kind of a backlash against manga in Korea um, because Japan has traditionally been an imperial power in the Far East. Um, and there's still kind of a shaky relationship between Japan and South Korea to this day. Um, many South Koreans kind of reject manga as a Japanese cultural hegemony. Um, but that hasn't stopped it from having a lot of young fans. Um, France, like I mentioned before, was an early adopter of manga. Um, aside from Japan and the United States, France is perhaps um, the country that has the, the largest and most unique comic culture of its own. Um, the French have always been very forward-thinking in identifying comics as art and viewing them as something to be studied from around the world. Um, many Japanese manga creators have been invited to study um, and to speak in France. Um, and they have a strong culture of manga scholarship over there as well. Um, manga is also extremely popular in Italy and Germany. Um, in Germany especially, there are a lot of comics creators who make their own manga-inspired comics. Um, and recently Brazil has become a big market for manga as well. Um, JBC, the Japan-Brazilian 
communications company publishes a lot of famous manga such as Roroni Kenshin. Um, and then of course in America we have a lot of companies such as Vertical, Dark Horse, Kodansha that put out manga in translation. Um, once they are translated into English for an American audience, it's very easy for them to cross the seas again to other English-speaking countries like Australia, New Zealand, and Britain. Um, many of the companies that publish manga in the United States are directly owned by some kind of Japanese publishing company. Um, Kodansha, for example, is one of the earliest publishers of comics magazines in Japan, um, and they print comics in English translation. Viz is actually owned by Shogakukan, which is one of the parent companies of Weekly Shonen Jump. So they have a direct licensing line to a lot of the hot properties from Japan. As manga becomes increasingly well known around the world, um, we have lots of examples of cultural exchange um, between the three big centers of comics culture. Japan, the United States, and France. Um, for example, the French have a comics tradition known as Bande de Cine. Um, I don't speak French, so I apologize if I really mangled that pronunciation, um, <clears throat> which focuses a lot on highly detailed and crisp line work um, that depicts beautiful and sweeping environments um, with a wide variety of characters um, and a very strong sense of kind of like a lived-in and very beautiful, luscious environment. Um, the art in the top left is by Jean Girard, who is perhaps the most famous French comics artist. Um, he has done a lot of concept work in Hollywood for films such as Blade Runner, um, and he has also done artwork for American um, superhero comics such as the Silver Surfer. Um, and we can see in the bottom, um, this is Tekon Concrete by the Japanese artist Taiyo Matsumoto. Um, and you can see that it's got a similar focus on very detailed backgrounds with precise line work. Um, and the focus on creating this like very real um, environment that the character lives in. And then of course American comics, um, perhaps a little bit frightened by the popularity of manga, um, have done a lot to absorb some of the characteristics of manga. Um, for example, there's a Marvel Mangaverse, which is heavily inspired both in, in art and in storytelling um, by manga. And then a lot of English-speaking creators, such as Brian Lee O'Malley, clearly draw a lot of artistic influence from manga. Um, you can see we've got some of the dramatic emotional expression, the action lines, um, the very clean and cartoony kind of line drawings that are popular in manga. So that's the very brief speed through of the history of manga. Um, if you have any questions, you can, you are definitely welcome to email me. Um, my email address is up on the screen. Um, I'm also known as Pharaonic Wolf on Tumblr and in various other fandom spaces. Um, so you are certainly welcome to message me any place that you can find me online. Thanks so much for viewing my presentation. Um, I'm going to throw up some of my sources in case you're interested in reading more about this topic. And I hope that you really enjoyed it. Um, send me your thoughts. Thanks.